Today, I'm finally spilling all the tea. Hey everyone, it's Amanda. Welcome back to my channel. Today, I'm finally sharing all of my bullet journal secrets that you guys have been wanting to know for me for years. There's always been a few things that you guys always, always ask about whenever I do a bullet journaling video on my channel, but they're never big enough to do like an individual video on. But I figured today I would compile them all into one big Amanda's secret guide to bullet journaling. These are just things that I've learned over the four years now bullet journaling and I don't think any of these tips are gonna be particularly life-changing or game-changing. It's not like I'm handing you guys some secret concoction for the perfect bullet journal spread because the perfect bullet journal spread doesn't exist. It's just all personal to you guys. But these are some tips that do help me when I'm creating spreads and hopefully you guys can apply them when you're bullet journaling and maybe it'll help you out in some way. Let's get started. Secret number one, tip number one, secret number one. I always, always, always get comments about my ability to draw straight lines without rulers. I posted a TikTok of me drawing a straight line without a ruler and it got like 8 million views. So clearly people are shook by this secret ability of mine. And I promise it's nothing too game changing, but there are some tips that I do have when drawing straight lines without a ruler. Specifically for bullet journaling, it's really, really helpful if you have a dotted notebook. And that's why a lot of people do use dotted notebooks when they're bullet journaling because it's really easy to measure things. It really helps when you have the dots there as sort of a guide. This one in particular is of course my Shop Amanda H. Lee dotted journal, which I love so much. And you guys know that is the current bullet journal that I'm using. So aside from using the dotted paper, which is obviously a big help with straight lines, my big secret, guys, are you ready for this? <laughs> it's just to draw the straight line towards you. I know that's nothing huge and it doesn't sound like it would make that much of a difference. But I promise it does make a big difference. I'll explain. But when I'm drawing a straight line, basically I am keeping my entire wrist and arm kind of stiff. I'm not, you know, letting, I don't know how to describe this actually. It's not like I'm moving the pen, if that makes sense. I'm actually just pulling my whole arm towards me in like a dragging motion. And that I've found gives the best results for a straight line. So I will give you guys an example. Oh, now there's, now there's pressure. What if I draw a squiggly line? So I'm just pulling this towards me. You can go as fast or as slow as you want. Obviously, you're not gonna have like a perfectly straight line like it's not gonna look exactly like a ruler But it should be like relatively pretty straight and um, You can keep practicing this Just keep pulling it towards you. It really helps a lot and using those dots as a guide And yeah, that's my secret guys and you can see here of course they're not perfectly straight lines and there's still some slight wobble to it, but I actually find that specifically when I'm bullet journaling, that adds a, a little bit of charm to the spreads and makes it look a little more hand-drawn, doodly, um, and personalized than just using straight up a ruler. Obviously, if you are looking for that perfect look, then you gotta use a ruler. There's no way about it. And that is literally the secret. And that's why you'll see whenever I'm drawing calendars or straight lines, I'll always rotate my book around depending on where I want the line to go because basically I'm rotating the book so that I always drag my lines towards me. It does make a big difference and I'll show you guys why. I feel like I wouldn't be able to make as straight of a line if I do it horizontally. Like obviously it's still possible but it's just not as easy for me so you'll always see me like rotating my book just so that I can always be dragging my lines towards my body. So uh, that's my straight line secret. And now you guys can be part of the no ruler gang too. <laughs> Amanda's bullet journaling secret number two is about the grid spacing cheat sheet page. If you guys have seen any of my bullet journal setup videos, the like 2021, the 2019 one, you guys will have seen the grid spacing cheat sheet guide page that I always do at the beginning. And I always get questions about how I use it. I wanted to walk you guys through how I use this to create my spreads because people still get confused whenever they see me using this. Firstly, I didn't come up with this idea. I think I saw this like two years back from uh, this user on Instagram. I'll insert 
their their name here so as you can see we have numbers all across the width to show how many dot spaces there are in this case there's 26 so you see i have 1 through 26 in each dot grid space all the way across so that means that there's 26 spaces I did the same thing vertically all the way down, which means that I have 38. And that helps because you can see A, how many grid spaces the whole page is wide, and you can also use it as a counter when you're splitting up the page. Next on the grid space page, you'll basically want to divide out your sections depending on what you use frequently in your bullet journal spreads. So in my case, a lot of my bullet journal spreads, I need to split up the page in half or thirds or quarters. So I did that both vertically and horizontally. So horizontally, as I mentioned, we have 26 dot spaces. So half of that would be 13, which is why I have a line down right on the 13th space here and you can see i marked it down at 13 and that way i can see oh if i need to split my page into half automatically i know i need to count out 13 dot spaces and then as you can see i have all these other marks which might look confusing at first but basically i've marked off what i typically need when i'm splitting up pages so a lot of times i'll need to split up pages into thirds so you'll see the red ones here are thirds I personally like to have a space in between because a lot of times when I'm making boxes for my bullet journal, I'll, you know, have spaces in between the boxes if that makes sense. And if I just want a line, then I can just include that blank space there. So based on my grid spacing cheat sheet, if I wanted to split up my page into thirds, I would need eight grid spaces wide with one space in between and eight again and then eight again. If I didn't want that one space in between, basically it would just be splitting it up into nine spaces. I hope that makes sense. Um, the same thing goes uh, vertically. As you can see, this is the thirds. So I split that up into 12 one space in between, 12 again, one space in between. There's a little bit of math involved, but it, that's why it really helps to have this grid spacing cheat sheet because I can always refer to it and see, oh, you know, today I need to split up my page into quarters and I'll see that, oh, that means that there's, it's six spaces. I hope this makes sense. It's kind of hard for me to explain verbally, but you essentially just want to do all of your math grid division work on this one page so that you can refer to it whenever you are splitting up your actual spread. So I made this weekly spread on my Twitch live stream and I knew that I needed four days on this side and three days on this side. Because I knew that I needed four columns, I was able to look over here and see that, oh, if I want four columns, it needs to be six wide. And then that's why I split mine up six wide. Let me know if that clears things up for you guys. If there's still a lot of people that are confused, maybe I will make a separate video on it, but I think I explained that okay. Fingers crossed. <laughs> on to Amanda's bullet journaling secret number three, which is how I come up with my themes and my designs and just make things look very cohesive and nice together. And I would say a lot of my artwork is actually based on graphic design elements, which is why I'm so interested in typography and texts, but there are a few things that come up in pretty much every design principle list. So I have it in front of me and I'm gonna go through them and kind of talk about how I apply that into my bullet journal. So the first principle is repetition and this really applies when I'm setting up a theme because with a Halloween theme, maybe some people think you need to add you know, pumpkins and candy and, and the bats and the slime and all of it all together. And there's no shame in that, but if you are looking to create something that is more, you know, design balanced, then repetition is really, really important. And choosing certain elements that you repeat throughout your whole setup will make it look really cohesive. So in my case, as you can see, I chose to repeat a few things. So the slime element, which is the shape, and then just a few like stars and bats. And that is repeated throughout the entire setup of my bullet journal. Um, you can see I always use those few elements and I don't try to change things throughout. So the next design principle is alignment. And this really actually applies to a lot of bullet journal setups because you are working with a lot of boxes and texts and lists and modules that need to be aligned. And this design principle is one of those things that you don't notice good alignment until al alignment is completely off and it's really off-putting when you notice like bad alignment. An example of bad alignment would be if things are super scattered around the page and again if that's what you're going for that's totally fine but these are just you know basic principles that make things look 
uh, typically more aesthetically pleasing to the eye and easy to read and makes your eye kind of like throw, flow throughout the page. If you carefully arrange the elements on a page that makes things really align nice, like make the text align with the boxes, it's just like a chef's kiss moment and it just looks way nicer. It kind of just makes like a really logical flow to the page. So as a general rule, as I mentioned, things should be lined up together and it kind of makes nice white spaces. This is a good example of uh, good alignment on a page. As you can see, I've lined up all my text here and it also lines up with this box. I've left aligned the text as well so that it's not like, you know, kind of zigzaggy, it's all lined up here. I have my text here that lines up perfectly in the center of this box. Same here, it's all kind of centered. They're all on the same plane and all lined up and it just fits really nicely and I can, you know, we can see that it's nice to look at and kind of neat and visually organized. The next design principle, I feel like I'm teaching a design class, is contrast. And contrast applies to not only like colors, but contrast in shapes, in sizes, in lines, and all of that. And I really use this a lot in my bullet journal spreads, specifically with colors. So contrast and color, a good example of that would be the October spread where I have the dark, dark black, and then I have the really bright, vibrant green and I feel like that gives off a nice contrast in color. The September page is also another good example of contrast in color. Obviously, it's not as apparent as the October contrast, but contrast can also be like subtle, if that makes sense. I have a darker purple and a lighter purple, which means that they're different hues, and same with this like lighter beige. Um, I also have really like block squared out fonts, but then I have circles and stuff. You just want to make sure that certain things stand out and certain things fall back um, and you wanna play off of each other like that. I think it's really good to stick to two or three different kind of elements that contrast each other just to make sure things are cohesive because you don't wanna have like 10 different colors going on because then nothing will contrast anything, they'll all kind of cancel each other out, which is why I do typically keep to a few different design elements. Like I'll stick to um, two or three colors or two or three shapes or two or three elements from that theme and make sure that there is nice contrast, repetition and alignment all throughout those. An example of contrast in size would be this like March spread here. I have the big leaf elements, which are really large, but then the other element that I have on the page are these small circles. It wouldn't look as good if I had so many large circles because then everything would be equal in size and there's no contrast, which kind of makes means that nothing stands out on the page. Because I have a contrast in these small circles, the leaves are able to jump out more, but still adds a nice element. Contrast can also refer to lettering, which I use a lot of contrast in lettering in my bullet journal spreads. So for example, like this October setup, there was so much going on with the, you know, the drips and all curvy and stuff. So I decided to go for something completely opposite of the really ornate design and just went for a simple all caps font because I felt like if I went for a really overly complex font, it would just not contrast enough with the actual design of the spread. Same goes for these quote pages that I do a lot of. You can see there's contrast in the lettering. I have like bold all caps font and then I have more of an elegant cursive font. I also have contrast in the color like this is completely black and then these ones are kind of white and hollowed out just to create a balance in that. Um, and then here I have more of an elegant font compared to a really typewritery written out structured font. So creating that contrast and balance in your lettering and your designs can really help things stand out more. In the case of these quote spreads, if I did the whole quote in the same font, size, color and everything, nothing would have stood out. But because I changed things up in between, you know, there's easily things that you can focus on. In this case, you know, you focus on the, the lettering of start because it does stand out more. And in here you focus on the progress. So you're able to really make things go directly into people's eyeballs. I know this was a lot. This is basically like a design visual arts course, but I think the main thing I like to keep in mind is that I try to keep things as concise as possible. And I know it might not seem like that because a lot of my spreads have doodles and everything, but I, in my head, I really am paring things down to the basic elements and um, 
colors that I've set for this specific theme. Like for this theme, I've really narrowed it down to the green and black elements. I have the slime and then maybe a few bats and stars and I'll use those sparingly throughout instead of trying to fit all of them together. For example, with this weekly spread, it could have been really easy for me to make the titles have like slime, maybe made the circles turn into bat shapes and just have all the elements spewed out into one page. But I really wanted to make it concise, so that's why I opted for simple box and a circle. We have the contrast in shapes, contrast in colors, as you can see. Uh, in terms of alignment, you can see they all align up here. The box tasks at the bottom align down here as well. And um, what else do we have? Repetition, I have repetition of shapes, <laughs> repetition of color, um, and repetition of the washi tape elements as well. By using those design principles, it just creates more unity on the page instead of having things look you know, too chaotic. Hello, I'd like to clarify a little. Um, this doesn't mean that just because uh, artwork or design follows these design principles exactly, it will automatically look amazing or good. And in the same token, if a piece of art or design doesn't follow these principles, that also doesn't mean that it looks bad. There's of course nuance in all of these things. Um, some rules are made to be broken. Sometimes certain principles will be more apparent than others. Uh, they're just meant to be general guidelines let's say if your design isn't turning out as well as it could maybe these things can be implemented or can be thought about when you're creating any sort of artwork or design if you like to make artwork that doesn't follow any of these principles that's totally okay these are just some things that i like to keep in mind and have gotten to be a little bit intuitive whenever i create anything now all right guys, so my last bullet journal secret is about fixing your mistakes. I always get questions about this, like people always think I don't make mistakes in my bullet journal and if you tune into any of my Twitch streams where I create bullet journal spreads live, you would know that's not the case. I make so many mistakes in my bullet journal, I just know how to fix them and how to problem solve. This is something I always say, but to me, art and anything creative is just creative problem solving. When I'm drawing something, I am just constantly thinking about how I can make it look better or how I can fix something that I did. And to me, that's what all creative things are. Like for songwriting, you're problem solving um, chords that go together. I actually do have a whole separate video on different ways to fix your bullet journaling mistake. I think a lot of people don't know it because it's from like three or four years ago, but I still use all of those tips and tricks. So I'll be sure to link it above. The one that I do use the most and the one that people ask me the most about is my white pens and my white markers, which I often use to cover up any mistakes, kind of like whiteout. So my white pen and white marker secrets, I'm gonna share with you guys my favorites here because I know it can be really hard to find a really good white pen and marker. So for white pen, when I wanna cover up mistakes that maybe are smaller or more detailed, or even if I'm using this to write on black paper, I'll always use the Jelly Roll 10. This is from Sack of America. Specifically, the 10 thickness, guys. I see a lot of comments from people saying that their Sakura jelly rolls aren't as opaque as mine. I think it might be because some people are using the 08 thickness or the 05 thickness, which isn't as good. The 10 thickness is where it's at. It's juicy, it's very opaque, and it writes really well on black paper. You can also use it to write on top of different black markers. And sometimes that actually affects the opaqueness of the jelly roll. I think a lot of people don't realize this, but this doesn't write well over certain markers. So I don't think it writes very well over Crayola Super Tips, but it does write really well over like actual archival ink, like the Pigma Microns or the Tombow Fudenoskes. So if your Sakura Jelly Roll 10 isn't writing well on top of certain things, maybe change up what you're using underneath it. The other three that I like, these are more paint marker styles. So these are for when I'm covering up larger mistakes. Um, my newest favorite is the Archernal of Acrylograph markers, which are really great. These come in two different thicknesses. This one is the 0.7 millimeter and the, the three millimeter is thicker. So, you know, I kind of use those depending on whether I'm writing stuff or covering mistakes. And then these ones, Uni Posca paint pens are great. They also come in different thicknesses. And this guy is for when I'm covering big mistakes. This is the Pilot Juice Paint Marker 
she's she's thick with two C's and I can easily cover a mistake like that. But if we're talking a big mistake as in the whole page type of thing, this right here is a really good secret and tool to have. These are the Archer and Olive notepads and they're just perforated pages that you can rip out and then glue into your bullet journal. So it's really easy. Instead of gluing your pages together, you can kind of have this extra handy dandy, you know, book of extra pages that you can glue in. I have them in different colors, but the white one is really good if you just want to restart your page. And that way you don't need to, you know, glue all your pages together and end up running out of pages in your bullet journal. Um, but for more decorative things, you can also have the, the black one and the craft paper one, which I use a lot in my spreads as well. I'll leave a link to these down below. They're really great. They fit well in A5 notebooks, so they actually do work well in the shop Amanda H. Lee journals as well. You guys already know I love Archer and Olive. They're great quality products. So that's how I cover my bullet journal mistakes. I do highly recommend you check out that uh, other video from like years back because there's even more tips in there. All right guys, so I spilled the tea. Those were four of my bullet journaling secrets. As I mentioned, it's nothing new, nothing life-changing or special, but I do keep all of those things in mind and use those tips and tricks when I'm creating my bullet journal spreads. So hopefully they help you guys out too. Let me know if there's anything else in particular that you guys are curious about my art design bullet journaling process. Maybe I can make a separate video on those or part two to bullet journaling secrets with Amanda. If you wanna see more of my spreads, you can follow me on Twitch for some live streams. We make weekly spreads live. Um, we recently restocked the Shop Amanda H. Lee washi tapes. And of course the uh, nope, dotted notebooks are available on there as well. Hopefully this video helped you out and you feel more well equipped with some tips and tricks and Amanda Rachel approved secrets when you're creating your spreads. I uh, hope you guys have an awesome day. Keep doodling. Bye everyone.